Good evening. We're on the air again with another edition of uh, Basis on the News. Every time we begin, I usually allude to the number of years we've been doing this. And uh, I think last time I said it was 14 years, and I think we're getting close to 15 years. But we've done a lot of shows. I think maybe uh, 125 or 130 of these shows. We've had many famous people, none more famous than the guy we're going to have on tonight. Uh, he's a dear friend of mine. We've known each other for 55 years. His name is Tom Johnson, W. Thomas Johnson. Tom Johnson uh, was CEO of CNN for many years, retired from CNN. Prior to that, he was the publisher of the Los Angeles Times, publisher of the Dallas Times Herald. And uh, prior to that, when he was a very, very young man, very young, he was executive assistant to President Lyndon B. Johnson. I met Tom when he was a in the first group of White House Fellows. Uh, many of you have heard of the White House Fellows Program. It began in 1965. Tom was in the first group of 15 White House Fellows who came to Washington for a year uh, to learn about the government and to educate themselves and I suppose educate others. And uh, Tom stayed. Tom stayed because President Johnson liked him, relied on him, uh, and he became a top aide to the president at a very, very young age. So Tom, welcome. We're delighted that you agreed to be with us. Al, I am delighted and honored to be here. I have been reading <laughs> a book that I like very much. The author is Harold C. Patius, and the title is American Journey. I love the book because I mentioned it several times favorably <laughs> in it. Uh, it does have one major uh, issue for me. There are not enough photos of me in the book, <laughs> but I hope that your viewers, uh, your listeners will, will know of this book. And seriously, I mean, uh, the story of your life and your family life and amazing Greek tradition within the Patius family is it's, it's just spectacular. And Hal, I'm also very pleased to know that you have been uh, doing patience on the news. I mean, this has brought you really sort of over into my world of media, and I'm deli delighted to, to be a part of it. Well, thank you, Tom. Because it's a little nerve wracking. Uh, you you uh, have been at the pinnacle of journalism, uh, both in the newspapers at uh, the Los Angeles Times as publisher and at Dallas uh, Times Herald but as the CEO of CNN. And so that brings me to my first question. There are gonna be many questions. We'll have a discussion here, but uh, I asked a lady uh, the other day that I was on a Zoom with, look, I'm gonna be interviewing Tom Johnson, the former CEO of uh, CNN. And what do you want me to ask him? And she said, oh, ask him about Ted Turner. I wanna know about Ted Turner. And I suppose, did you know Jane Fonda too? Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes. so anyway, but so okay, maybe you could uh, summarize for the folks. This is a very interesting man, Mr. Turner, right? Until I met Ted Turner, I thought that LBJ, President Johnson, was the most complex man I'd ever <laughs> known. But Ted actually eclipses that. And I think, you know, Ted Turner, first he wins America's Cup in this unbelievable sailing competition. He takes one of the worst teams in baseball, the Braves, then they become the Atlanta Braves, from the bottom to win the world championship. He wins the heart of Jane Fonda. But beyond that, and these are all creations of his, Headline News, CNN, Airport Channel, tech, Turner Classic Movies, uh, all of it. And, and I must tell you, he cares so much about leaving this world a better place than he found it, Hal. And he just, as an example, he gave $1 billion cash to the United Nations to strengthen the organization that he thought could help to bring about peace between the countries on the planet rather than the wars on it. But Ted's an extraordinary guy, and I, I love working with him 
directly, reported to him directly uh, for 11 years. Wow. Well, that's uh, that's it. And that that is my friend is going to appreciate that answer because she was uh, she was very, very interested in that. So our listeners uh, probably don't realize and I need to tell them that uh, the miracle of Zoom allows us to interview you in Atlanta, Georgia. So yes. you're in your you're in your home in Atlanta, yes. correct? OK. And I have so, over my shoulder. Uh, my wife, Edwina, my wife of almost 58 years, who also knows Hal Pacious quite well, because when we came to Washington at an early age, Hal was the very first person to welcome us to Washington and to a very different life of, of, of public service and politics and the White House and, and trying to uh, make the world a better place through what LBJ was doing and issues like civil rights and much more. But I owe it to Hal to, for, for not only a lifetime of friendship since then, but really an introduction to a world that was very different from any world that I had experienced in Macon, Georgia or at Harvard Business School or uh, in journalism school. Well, uh, we're gonna move on with this. I appreciate that, uh, Tom. The audience needs, needs to know that they, they, they need the truth, which is rare these days. Incidentally, uh, they need the, the, the truth. It didn't take me to set Tom Johnson on his course through life, but I was pleased to be part of it at the very beginning. Uh, Tom, you're down in Atlanta and um, you've, you, uh, Georgia has been in the news a lot, uh, a lot lately. And you have a governor who kind of tried to do the right thing. You have a secretary of state who definitely did the right thing. You have a deputy secretary of state, all Republicans yes. who, who had to hold off and hold the line under enormous pressure from uh, Donald Trump. Uh, tell us a little bit about Georgia politics. So these guys are now in trouble for yes. trying to be honest, right? It's fascinating that three of the most significant Republican leaders in the state, starting with our governor, but, but also go, going to our Secretary of State, and to, uh, uh, they audited, they checked, they rechecked the voting uh, records here. I mean, they did every imaginable uh, uh, check and recheck and concluded that the voting was legal, uh, that, that it was done by the highest standards. And I am certain that if they had seen uh, misconduct, that they as Republicans and devoted supporters of President Trump uh, would have reported it. But instead, they, they did not cave to the pressure that came down from, from President Trump. They, they said, Mr. President, there's no evidence of wrongdoing here. And in, and in doing the right thing, they then were basically the targets of very, very harsh uh, statements and even a pledge by what former President Trump that he will come and campaign against this governor when he's up next. I mean, it's really, it's really sad to see that. These men absolutely were ethical in their handling of this election. And as a result, they have just received enormous, even threats, I mean, personal threats to their lives and to their lives and their family. So, so Tom, you know, you've lived, you, you've, you, you've lived in California, you lived in Texas, you've been uh, uh, all over the world, but you were born and raised in Georgia, you live in Georgia now. Uh, you must know Republicans in Georgia who are very normal, traditional Republicans. Uh, are they upset about what's happening? It's, it's very interesting. First of all, it is amazing to me how many of the Trump loyalists continue to support him and support him no matter what uh, new, new wrongdoing may, may be, uh, uh, an accusation may, may, may come out. But yes, there are Republicans who are embarrassed uh, by, by that and also now embarrassed by a young Congresswoman from North Georgia who is a conspiracy theorist, and, and is, this, is a, this is such a different world 
And, and of course, Georgia is just one example of one state. I mean, this is happening in, in states throughout the, the country. Arizona is, is another example. What happened in Pennsylvania? Uh, hell, it's such a different world than the world that you and I knew we were in Washington. It's still tough for me to understand quite how we got there. Another Georgian, I think, Newt Gingrich, who was a very tough Republican Speaker of the House. A lot of it may have originated uh, with, with Newt, but uh, it, much of this has also been building for some time. Yeah, and I agree with uh, your observation about Newt Gingrich. He was uh, one of the more consequential uh, politicians of the 20th century because he changed the tone in Washington. Yes. He, he, it was uh, burn every bridge, uh, burn the house down uh, type of politics and it's, and it's stayed with us. But back to uh, you know, uh, Georgia again, this woman, Marjorie Taylor Greene, the conspiracy theorist who says absolutely crazy things. Nobody can think they're saying things that she says. She elected to Congress this year. So yes. why is that? How does somebody who's crazy get elected to Congress? You don't know, but I don't know. How? And, uh... I do not know that answer. How the public would vote for a person who has alleged uh, that, that she would like uh, kill others in public life, that she uh, uh, would kill Nancy Pelosi, uh, the speaker. Uh, and and, and, and it, it is, it, it is it's really tragic. And of course, I am embarrassed for my state to be represented by a woman, a person, a person uh, of, of, of that uh, unusually, uh, uh, I mean, it's, it's on one hand it's bizarre, but it's also almost evil uh, in, in a way. And uh, I, I so hope that responsible voters will uh, recognize that and that, uh, that she'll only have one term and incidentally, I try to stay out of partisan politics, despite my background. I mean, I really do strive to uh, make the calls based on the merits. On you know, I've voted for good Republicans. I've and and, and I have very good Republican friends. But th this this world is is. I'm hoping we've always heard that the pendulum of politics swings, and I'm hoping it's now been swinging over to the right back uh, in a way that we haven't seen in quite some time. But there are also though, there are a lot of fringe elements, very much friend, ele fringe elements out on, out on the left. How to reunite America, I think is the biggest challenge that those going into public service today have. How to reunite this nation. Well, the network you used to run had a special on last night that uh, I watched about yes. this issue. Yes. And uh, it, was, it, it depressed me, uh, 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 I'll be frank. Uh, uh, you and I have been around a while and we've never seen anything like this in our lifetimes. And you particularly have been involved in public life as a major newspaper publisher and a major network uh, chieftain. Uh, it, it's a little bit scary and I don't know how it's going to be uh, uh, resolve. But one of the things they pointed out, Tom, was that in the days when you and I were in Washington, the two parties were not at each other's throat. They had different views on certain things. But the Democrats had both, uh, had both liberals and conservatives in the Democratic Party, yes. Southern conservatives, yes. and, the, and the Republicans had liberal and conservative. Yes. And that's how a lot got done. Do you, as a Southerner, do you think race plays any role in these pol monumental political dynamics? In my opinion, race plays a major role in all of this. Uh, and I think we have seen it here in my state and in my region of the world for many, many years but I think it is playing a role throughout our nation. And I, I, and I hope that there will be much more discussion 
uh, about race and how we can support each other. Good citizens of both sides can look at issues of, 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 of race. And, 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 and of course, that would clearly also uh, in, include the, the role of Hispanics and, 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 and certainly, you know, our gay and lesbian uh, friends uh, and, and Asians. I mean, there is a serious problem that exists and the only way to deal with it is openly, honestly, admit uh, that uh, our educational institutions have much more to do. But Hal, I think so much, but also as family, that, that, you know, fortunately I had parents who were not racist. Uh, and, and fortunately as a young man here in, a, in the middle of Georgia, uh, I had African-American young friends, um, uh, it helped me, but uh, so much of us being brought together was uh, uh, at least in the early stages, a lot of it had to do with, with our parents and our grandparents and, and, their, and, and their thoughts. The schools, certainly the churches, uh, but but it but it I must tell you I think it I think racism is almost a part of every institution in our society. You were uh, you went to the University of Georgia, and when you were a, a student there, you were you ran the University of New uh, University newspaper, the college yes. newspaper. Uh, was the university being integrated while you were there? Yes. Uh, in 1962, Charlene Hunter, later to become Charlene Hunter Galt, and Hamilton Holmes uh, desegregated the University of Georgia uh, because of my role as a campus reporter and also as a reporter for the Macon Telegraph. I actually uh, stayed near Charlene as she uh, entered the University of Georgia and as she attended classes and even was out front of her dormitory on at least two nights when there were demonstrations uh, there. Uh, for, first of all, uh, the violence at the University of Georgia was not as difficult as it had been in other, in, in other uh, universities such as the University of Mississippi. Um, I befriended Charlene at the beginning of a lifetime friendship uh, she and I actually worked together at one point at CNN. She was the Africa correspondent uh, for CNN, but uh, she and Hamilton did, did integrate it. And, and at that time, I built some lifetime friendships. Also Vernon Jordan, the legendary Vernon Jordan accompanied her uh, as she came through the gates of the University of Georgia. But how I saw as she walked along the campus early days, people shouting some of the most vile comments at her. I saw on one occasion, a young student try to reach out and spit at her. Uh, it missed her, but it hit one of the security officers uh, walking with her. Uh, she came down and worked with us on the red and black, the campus paper. But even there, she did not receive the kind of welcome that I had expected she would get even from some of the young student journalist, so she did not stay on the paper, yet she went on to great recognition as a professional journalist with the New York Times. So it, it just, I, I picture all of this, and you wonder, the virulence, the, the hate, the hate. They didn't yes. know her, they knew they didn't know anything about her other than the color of her skin, which yes. was enough for them to hate her. Yes. It's yes. just incredible. But t Tom, uh, leaving Georgia for the moment and talk a little bit about what's happening in, uh, in Washington. Uh, I want, I, I, I've been wanting to ask you a, a question because you spent far longer with LBJ uh, than I did, but uh, Donald Trump condemned everybody who wasn't with him. He, he's gonna run people against Republicans in primaries unless they do what he wants them to do. He punishes people who don't do exactly what he wants or who are not sycophants and kissing up to him all the time. Now, Lyndon Johnson 
he had, there were Democrats who I remember, particularly uh, when the war got going in, in 67, 66, uh, prominent Democrats in the Senate who were opposed to the war and who were a real thorn in Lyndon Johnson's side. Some of them friends of his. Uh, you were there, you uh, watched it. Which, well, it's certainly uh, Senator Fulbright uh, and Senator Wayne Morse, uh, they were very strong critics of, of the war. Uh, it pained LBJ to, to have the, uh, uh, th that opposition. But Hal, it was really interesting because uh, they, both w w Wayne Morse and Senator Fulbright would support President Johnson on his domestic program and vigorously oppose him on Vietnam. And you know, LBJ taught me a lesson, which was today we may lose their vote today on Vietnam, but we will lead their vote tomorrow on great society initiative, housing, fair housing, or, or, or education, or, or, or uh, you know, Corporation for Public Broadcasting. And LBJ, uh, while he was an incredibly sensitive person and would like to have everybody love him, uh, he had, but, but he understood some of that. And of course, another best example was his closest friend was former Senator Richard Russell, who was a strong segregationist. He went to his grave a segregationist. President Johnson had to literally just sort of overpower Senator Russell to pass the Voting Rights Act and the Civil Rights Act. But Senator Russell was one of the strongest supporters of the, our policies uh, in Vietnam and Southeast Asia. So he didn't want to make enemies of people even when they were opposed to him on something. Is that right? Well, with one exception, I think he, he had a very awkward, difficult relationship with Senator Robert Kennedy. You know more about that perhaps than do I, but uh, it, I, think, I think Senator Kennedy, who in so many ways was this brilliant, inspirational, uh, certainly US Senator and, and later candidate for the, for the presidency, I mean, it, it, there was just a continuing sort of clash between the two men. And I, I regretted that. Uh, and, and yet, uh, I, I, I don't, there, was, there, was, there was no solution that any of us could come up with. And I'm ashamed that uh, Senator Ted Kennedy and LBJ got along well. Uh, uh, Mrs. Kennedy and the Kennedy family got along very, very well with LBJ. But uh, when we talk about, uh, uh, we, re we really talk about tough uh, opposition uh, or un not unfavorable <laughs> attitudes about each other. Uh, that was that was probably the toughest toughest one. You were because uh, you were around LBJ a lot, particularly in uh, his uh, last uh, two or three years in the White House. And uh, were you around him the day that Martin Luther King was? assassinated? I was standing by the two tickers outside the office that you and I shared and I just happened to be standing by the ticker when a flash, which is the highest form of a bulletin, all of the bells on the two ticker machines went off. I looked down and I saw the AP lead one sentence, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King has been shot and I, and, 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 and I just ripped it off and walked right over, uh, had to, went right through the president's two secretaries. And I said, I must take this in. Usually you had to stop, explain yourself, maybe get rejected by either Marie Faber or, or, or uh, Juanita Roberts. But I took it right in and handed it to the, to the president. Uh, and he was sitting there incidentally at the time with the chairman of Coca-Cola, Robert Woodruff, and a man who went on to become governor of Georgia, Carl Sanders. Uh, so I, I handed him the note uh, advising him of, of the fact that Dr. King had been shot. Now, the first flash did not notify the world that Dr. King had been killed. That came in a, in a later notice. And what about when Robert Kennedy was assassinated? Were you around the president that day? I was very much around him, along with then appointment secretary Jim Jones. The president said, provide them meaning the members of the family, with everything uh, that, that was needed. So from that point forward, whether it was presidential aircraft, 
the 707s, the Jet Stars, uh, whatever was requested. And, and I had a lot of direct ties with, with the staff all the way through on that. And of course, President Johnson you know, called, called Mrs. Kennedy. Uh, she called family members. Uh, and, and he was greatly pained by it. I mean, you think about the assassination of Dr. King and Bobby Kennedy, both in the year 1968, which is a year where we were having unbelievable body counts of the losses of Americans in uh, Vietnam. I mean, sometimes up to 400 a week body bags. Uh, so so that, was a, that was an incredibly tough year. And uh, it, it, so you saw what it was doing to you. You think that the burden of that, of all the deaths of people uh, had to weigh on him. And do you think he felt trapped that he want, obviously wanted to get out of Vietnam and he, couldn't figure out he how? He so wanted to get he so wanted to find a way to get a peace agreement signed between the United States and Hanoi, between the United States and, and the Viet Cong and the South Vietnamese. And one of the reasons he decided to step down March 31st of 68 was not just because his health, because his health was not good, or because of the campaign and, and Senator Kennedy and others deciding to run against him, but more than anything, he wanted on his watch to be able to bring about a peace uh, with South Vietnam. And we got at least as far as getting them to the conference table finally in Paris uh, for, for discussions that would be led on our side by April Harriman. But uh, I, I must tell you, peace eluded him. And, uh, and, and the only thing I have, told a few people privately is that President Nixon did advise him on the day or two, I don't know which, before his death, that it looked as though we were going to be able to have, quote, a peace deal with honor. So while we're on President Nixon, uh, so President Johnson's number one goal was a peace being made. They were in Paris. Uh, talking, there were peace talks going on, hopes were up, uh, but you personally have knowledge that President Nixon was responsible for ruining those peace agreements, though that peace talks. I want to be very careful about my facts, yeah. especially with you. Um, yeah. It was only after we left the presidency that I was able to get documentation and they were notes that were made by Bob Holloman in a conversation with President Nixon in which President Nixon told Bob to have Mrs. Chenault continue with her efforts. And the story there, of course, was that after all this time and effort and billions of dollars that we put in and to finally to get the four sides, Hanoi, Viet Cong, South Vietnam and the United States to the conference table, the South Vietnamese pulled out. They backed out. And we're sitting there saying, my God, why would they? Well, as history and the archives now show, Mrs. Chenault, the widow of the famous Claire Chenault, acted and as a Nixon, a and a, and a Nixon for, go-between. For the staff of, of President Nixon and were able to get the South Vietnamese convinced that they would get a better deal if they waited for President Nixon to be elected, then they would out of LBJ and Hubert Humphrey. LBJ considered that treason. And I, to this day, don't fully understand why Hubert Humphrey, who was advised of this, decided that the country had just had too much that year, too much catastrophe, and he did not leak it. I'm convinced had it been leaked. So they uh, would have been elected in 68. I will go to my grave believing it. Uh, and but uh, Tom, but, but, but nobody leaked it. But Tom, there's some people that say, why didn't Johnson uh, uh, say something about it? Uh, LBJ later told me, and he told Clark Clifford and Abe Fortas, who was two advisors, I think, the two advisors on that decision, that it was up to Hubert Humphrey. That, that, that I should tell you, 
we had used intercepts. We had used uh, taps on the Vietnam embassy. We had used other surveillance techniques that were questionable in terms of legality, perhaps. And I think had we gone with it, all of those, uh, all of that would have been public. Uh, and you know, it, it probably would have come as no surprise that the United States tapped the lines of the South Vietnamese embassy for its conversations. But but Hal, uh, he he let Hubert Humphrey make that decision, and I don't know whether it was one of the most patriotic acts of anybody in public service. I mean, I loved Hubert Humphrey, but it was either one of the most patriotic acts or one of the acts that I just, I mean, not, not announcing it led to the, to the Nixon presidency. Now, the Nixon presidency had a lot of Watergate, probably the worst, but it, it, Nixon presidency did a lot of peace with China and my God, the, the work that they did. I mean, it's, it, 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 by comparison with the Trump presidency, the Nixon presidency deserved, uh, you know, peace, every peace award you get. Yeah, but so so Tom, I want to talk a little bit about the press, LBJ, and the and the press because the, he the the press was really on him, heavy. The criticism was uh, substantial, yeah. and and uh, it, it must have hurt. He, he didn't like it, did he? LBJ, uh, I mean, literally, LBJ wanted all the press coverage to be positive. He wanted, uh, and you knew Hugh Sidey and, and Bill Potter and, 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 you know, all of the various people, the Texas press, like Margaret Meyer and uh, Merriman Smith or UPIB. LBJ had this, he wanted, to, he wanted to have a wonderful relationship with Muriel Dobbin and, and all of the uh, reporters covering the White House. And he would walk the grounds of, of South Grounds with them and he'd take them in his Lincoln convertible at one occasion with them throwing beer cans out the, the window, which I think uh, Muriel Dobbin wrote about in the Baltimore Sun. But, 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 the, but, the, but the, the press wanted access to LBJ. And, and my God, I mean, if he saw something on the ticker that it offended him, it wouldn't just call Moyers or Christian or me, he'd call the reporter directly. And if Dan Rather didn't give him any satisfaction at CBS News, he'd call Frank Stanton, the chairman of, uh, of CBS. I mean, God, you know, and then he, had to, he read every newspaper, including the Baltimore Sun. He, 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 he read all the wires. He was the most informed presidency. And, and, when, and when, the, when he wasn't able to get it fast enough, he would open the lid on, on, on the uh, wire services and read it right down. It was getting sort of tight uh, out coming through. But uh, he had the credibility issue. And the big issue was the reports that were coming back to the Pentagon and to the White House that we were using General Westmoreland was telling us like, this light at the end of the tunnel and that we were killing far more, uh, far more uh, uh, Vietnamese than, than we were, uh, than we were losing. Uh, we were presenting a much more positive um, perspective, a much more positive report on Vietnam than the truth. And, and, and there were reporters out there, David Halberstam and Peter Arnett who were writing stories that was saying how um, terrible the war was going. And Cronkite finally said, there's no victory out here for America. It's a stalemate and we better negotiate a peace. At which point LBJ said, if I've lost Cronkite, I've lost, I've really lost America uh, on it. But the, the press was, uh, I really think the press was more accurate then in reporting on Vietnam than our reports that we were putting out at the Pentagon and sometimes at the White House uh, because that was what we were being fed back. Thank goodness the CIA director, Dick Helm, seemed to always tell LBJ straight talk, usually just one-on-one. -on -one. Uh, but, but we were badly damaged by our press policies related to Vietnam. And uh, Tom, you were someplace I wasn't, you were on the inside when they, they had these Tuesday lunches with the yes. Secretary of Defense, Secretary of State, the CIA uh, uh, director, uh, uh, and the president, and you. You and were me. in the room. And so you were privy to all of the discussion. 
So I was. I was not a policymaker. I was sitting there with my reporter notebook, taking down notes as best I can. LBJ had even sent me to morning classes. I think Vicky McCannon might have been a part of those classes, but I know there were a couple of other there were a couple of others to, to, to learn to do shorthand. Uh, I remind people there was no Sony Walkman in 1965, 66, 67. They would use yeah. large real reel, reel. But yes, I was there not as a policymaker, but as a note taker. And sometimes I was sort of stunned by what I heard. And uh, but all I was doing is getting those notes, trying to get them down, and hopefully all of them are on uh, available now at the LBJ Library. You know, there are hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages. Of, of, of notes there. Fortunately, typed uh, for those like Robert Caro who are at work on their books. Tom, I'm going to ask you to talk about the difference in the media now and then and the, and the importance of the fact that we just had three networks. There were those three days. highly and, respected networks. So, but what, I want you to tell that story and then I want you, I have to get up and get something to plug in my my iPad that I'm using to conduct this interview because I just saw that it's running out of power. So May I you, keep talking? you keep talking right. about, uh, about the networks and 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 then when tell them I about was how in the White House. There were three highly respected news oh, yeah. divisions of three networks: NBC News, CBS News, ABC News. There were very highly regarded anchors like John Chancellor, Walter Cronkite and others. Uh, and it really was only in uh, 19, for our news network, CNN, that, that we sort of the, the, the world changed dramatically. And of course, since then, there have been other 24 hour services, primarily Fox News and MSNBC. The, the three cable news channels and the three network channels became really quite quite uh, 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 different. Uh, the, the, the network news channels maintain just a morning news show and an evening news show. And even to today, uh, those three networks do an outstanding job. I mean, ABC, NBC, CBS do an outstanding job. In my opinion, what really changed was when Rupert Murdoch installed Roger Ailes as the creator and the owner, uh, the creator and, and the president of uh, Fox and News. Chris Manny's question, Jim? Murdoch and Roger Eales saw that there was a niche that, that conservatives did not feel that the media was, was, was reporting their perspectives. They saw the media as liberal. They saw CNN, which in my opinion was not, but they saw CNN at some extent, so certainly okay. MSNBC is more liberal. This is a very personal view, one that I have not shared with many people at all. Uh, Rupert Murdoch and Roger Ailes did more to take down journalism in the United States and in case of Murdoch in other countries where he had ownership uh, than, than any other factor. They, they, and they did a brilliant job First of all, adopting fair and balanced as their slogan. No network was ever less fair or less balanced uh, un under Roger Ailes' uh, reign. But, uh, and, and I also have to admit that Roger was a friend of mine. And when I tell people that, they just, they, they just they're stunned uh, in a way. But Roger took Fox News way down, uh, about as far as it go. And, and later we learn about many of his personal transgressions but today we have so many other sources of information, sources that is, are not edited, no editing, no fact checking of so much of what flows like gushers uh, out, out of this vast internet online world that we, we have today. And, and, and all I can say is thank goodness that we still have the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Los Angeles Times, the Wall Street Journal, but uh, we, 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 we have too many uh, other services that are just devoted to, to almost conspiracy theories and to sensationalism and facts be damned. Now, Tom, when you, we, uh, I wanna just switch years a little bit. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson 
retired from the presidency, uh, you went with him yes. to Texas. And I guess advice with Bill Moyers. Yes. <laughs> and um, you you left and uh, you actually flew with you went to the inauguration and you and LBJ and others got on Air Force One at Andrews Air Force Base and flew to Texas. And you were his executive assistant in his retirement in Texas. And then you ran his radio and television stations and other businesses, right? Well, I became executive vice president and chief operating officer of what was called Texas Broadcasting that owned radio stations, television stations, Muzak, photo processing, banking, cattle, ranching, a few other things. I mean, it, 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 I, I found myself learning to do such things as how to pregnancy test a cow. I mean, in my role as a head, of, head, of, head of Comanche Cattle Company. But, you know, it was a fascinating experience. But I should tell you how I continued to want to go back to my profession. I had journalism in my blood. I had print ink flowing through my veins. And, and, and I finally, I was getting a, some good offers. And I finally told President and Mrs. Johnson shortly before his death that, that I hoped that I could return to, to my profession. And I, and I know a lot of people said, why, why didn't you stay on? They even offered you an equity position in Texas yeah. Broadcasting. But, but I, I felt it was, it, was, it was time for me to get back while I was still young and try to earn my way up the ranks. I still wanted to become a newspaper publisher, which is what I told those interviewing me for the White House Fellows in 1969. I hope one day that I can get to be a, a, a newspaper publisher. Now, Evan, you, you mentioned Texas Broadcasting, all those businesses, the Johnson family businesses, and everybody thought thinks that LBJ, you know, conniving and so built that business and he was he was responsible for it. He, and his wife was just the, the front for it. But he LBJ really... did not run the LBJ family businesses. They were run but first on a daily basis by a man named J.C. Kellum, who had been with them since early days. Uh, who, who, and, and I was one of two people brought in to succeed Mr. Kellum. And Mr. Kellum decided he didn't want anybody to succeed him. And I think he died at his desk late, later. But Mrs. Johnson took her inheritance from her family inheritance. And it was that money that Jesse Kellum used to invest in this small radio station, which later was, was, was built into a TV station. And of course, what was so interesting is for quite some time, there was only one television tower in Austin. And in the campaign of 1964, Barry Goldwater said, yes, he could always recognize Austin, Texas, when he was flying himself around America, because it was the only major city in America that only had one TV tower. <laughs> True at the time. <laughs> so, Tom, uh, Tell us about Mrs. Johnson. You were very close to Mrs. Johnson. Tell now, Mrs. Johnson people was are intrigued the person, about her. Mrs. Johnson was the person who had great wisdom, thoughtfulness, balance. Whenever LBJ would sort of go into a, either a deep funk about something or get upset about something, I'll never forget when, when, she, when he would get upset with her. Mrs. Johnson would sort of place her hand on his, on his lower arm and say, now, Lyndon, now, Lyndon, she would calm him down. And, and, and she also was a, such an individual force of nature. She wanted the highways of America not to have used car lots with old cars, just damaged cars all along the freeways. She didn't want billboards that Ted Turner and others were erecting on the nation's highways. So, I mean, she, she created this effort to, quote, beautify America, and she worked very hard on her own with our national forest, and, and, and yet, and when I drive around Washington today, or down the highways of Georgia, or Texas, or so many others, and I look at those wildflowers each spring that, that pop up, uh, and, and I think about her, but it was far more than that. She was the one that encouraged him to step down and, 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 and not to seek a new term. She saw his health was not good. She saw it was tearing him apart. Uh, she recommended that he not seek a, make, make a new term. And uh, she also just 
solid, solid. And, and uh, I admired her immensely. Now, LBJ a couple of times found that I was responding directly to Mrs. Johnson and taking orders directly to Mrs. Johnson. He called me in one morning and he said, Tom, I want to make one thing really clear to you. And he sort of thumped me on the chest like this. And he said, Tom, you work for me, not Lady Bird. I said, now you understand? <laughs> you work for me, LBJ, not Lady Bird. I said, yes, sir, Mr. President. So in any case, I continued to work with Mrs. Johnson because the two in combination were vastly stronger than either one of them separately. Tom, you know, you were, of course, in his last years around President Johnson all the time. In the weeks leading up to his death, uh, you knew he was pretty sick, didn't you? He, he, was, he was taking nitroglycerin tablets and placing them beneath his tongue uh, the doctors, Dr. DeBakey and Dr. Cooley in Houston, had told him that he was not a candidate for, uh, for any type of heart surgery. He had damaged his heart too much when he was in the Senate and a heart attack there. Uh, and, and his last real major event was a civil rights, a big civil rights event at the LBJ Library just days before his death, in which he basically recommitted himself and all of those in attendance to let's overcome the wrongs that exist in our society. He had seen the way young Mexican students were treated in Catula, Texas. He had seen as he was a Dixiecrat, how segregation kept blacks from eating at the lunch counter, from, from going to the restroom in, 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 in the restaurant, from staying in a hotel that was an all white hotel. He saw it in his core. And if there was one subject that mattered to him, it was to try to give the poor people of America an opportunity to improve themselves. When he died, were you there? And were you, you were in Austin? I was at my desk. Mrs. Johnson called me and her exact words were, Tom, we did not make it this time. Uh, Lyndon is dead. I'd like for you to uh, handle the announcement and the arrangements. The arrangements had already been worked out with a part of the Department of Defense that does that for every president and first lady, former president, first lady. And, and so I did announce it and it turned out that Walter Cronkite took my call live on CBS Evening News. Uh, and, and so he got the break on that story, largely because he didn't ask for a call back to double check. He didn't go wait for the wire service to come across, but he got a break of quite a break on the world by just the fact that we knew each other and, and, and he took it. But you know, uh, LBJ left the way he wanted. He, with no advance notice to the press, uh, uh, Hal Patience and I could rarely get any kind of advance notice on when the president was leaving on a trip, whether he was gonna fly out that day to the ranch or something else. I think because of the Kennedy assassination, when, when, when the schedule was published ahead of it, and the, 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 the route of travel, everything. I think LBJ thought that too much, too much lead time would, would enable A, Lee Harvey Oswald. And God knows we've had many that since then, attempts on the lives of President, President Reagan and President Ford and, and others. But uh, in any case, uh, LBJ was a complicated guy. I, I, I worked directly for him for eight years. I survived. Uh, I love the old man. I mean, despite all, he could be mean, he could be tough, but also he could be generous and thoughtful and kind. Uh, he did want to make, he wanted to use his time, the workaholic that he was, he wanted to use his time to make America a better place. And he did. Tom, you're, most of our listeners uh, pay a lot of attention to uh, public affairs and so forth. And so they're very aware, some of them, uh, most of them are aware of the fact that Robert Caro uh, has written four volumes about Lyndon Johnson and is working on a fifth volume. It's a monumental work, perhaps, uh, I would say one of the two or three most monumental works ever done on an American president. Yes. And um, he's, he is obviously fascinated by Johnson and all these different dimensions of him. And so 
do you think that these volumes, the fact that Robert Caro decided to devote a significant part of his own life and, uh, and create five volumes about Lyndon Johnson uh, is been great or good for Lyndon Johnson's legacy? The answer is yes, yes. Robert Carroll has done an extraordinary job in researching, not just the documents, but, 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 but I mean, even like going and living for a period of time in central Texas. He has, he has, he interviewed early on so many of, of the Johnson closest allies like John Conley uh, or Walter Jenkins or others, Mrs. Johnson to some extent that are no, that are no longer uh, alive today. Um, I expect his final book will have some extraordinarily tough um, reporting about decision making as it related to Vietnam. And I expect that, uh, and I expect that it will be, it will probably, I don't know, it probably will be the best read of, of his books, uh, uh, all, of, all of which I, I've read. But in any case, uh, Robert Caro is, uh, I mean, he, we use, he used his title, Master of the Senate, in his, uh, one of his volumes about LBJ. Robert Caro is the master of the LBJ story. Uh, yeah. Sort of the good, the bad, I mean, the epic highs and, and, and the lowest lows. Some of the, uh, some of the, the he, every, every president has aides like you and people that are close to them. And then there are others that are sycophants, you know, uh, they just, they just, uh, whatever that president does says is, is, great, is, is great with them. Now, George uh, Reedy called me a sycophant. And that really hurt. Who did? And I must tell you, George Reedy, who had been a press secretary briefly for President Johnson, you know, basically said he took a bunch of sycophants with him uh, to Texas. I really tried to be, uh, I really tried to be very honest with OBJ, and I also tried never, ever, ever to leak because I knew two things would destroy any relationship if he thought I leaked information or if he thought that I was disloyal. So I would have conversations with him in complete privacy, just the two of us, just sort of talking. I mean, a young guy from Georgia and, a, and, and an aging warrior, uh, and we'd have conversations. And sometimes, I mean, he taught me how to drink scotch and soda uh, <laughs> uh, on it. I, 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 anyway, I developed this personal friendship with him. But I think if, uh, if, if you could ask LBJ today, did I try to design my relationship with him so that I agreed with him? Uh, no, it wasn't. And I actually have some notes that make it pretty clear. And I hope I'm not remembered in Carol's book as a sycophant because I really tried to be independent and honest and truthful with him. And I felt the only way I could really serve him uh, what was was that way? And uh, anyway, I guess perception matters, and uh, we'll wait and see how it all turns out. Tom, I would say one thing as we wrap this up. I've known you for fifty-five years, and I, I know you. I know your personality. I know your values. You couldn't be a sycophant to anyone. <laughs> there is no human being to whom you could be. A sycophant. It is not in your nature. Uh, I hope that I've tried. I've tried, Al, and I think that you know we talk about truth versus lies today. There's a battle going on between truth and lies today in our society. Not just in media, not just in politics, but there's a battle that's underway between truth and lies. I don't know how, how it's all going to end up. I hope that truth prevails because I don't know what America would be like if, if truth doesn't avail. But, 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 but we're in a period right now of testing to determine whether the people like this member of Congress from North Georgia are all these Trumpians and, and their view that, that, that really Donald Trump didn't have anything to do with taking over 
the, the capital or whatever. We are in a period of testing now, and I hope that the forces of good can win. But I, I, I am careful. I'm carefully optimistic, but I'm not so sure. You've been around a long time, Tom Johnson, and I can sense the concern you have about the state of our nation today and the question of truth, which is always first in the minds of journalists like yourself. And none of us know what the answer is, but we hope, we hope, and I'll be specific, that Republicans all across this country will say they stand on the side of truth and they're gonna do something about it because they're the only ones with the power. Yeah. The people are the only ones with the power yeah. to make sure that truth once again becomes ascendant. Yeah. Well, we, uh, have a, we have a wonderful new president and I hope that he can, he, I've known him since maybe 40 years and I know that he wants to be a bipartisan. I know he wants to be a good leader. I know he wants to represent all Americans. He said that several times and it's not bullshit. He wants yeah. to represent all Americans. And I just hope he's given the opportunity. Tom, I can't thank you enough for taking the time uh, uh, with us. You, you've, you've been absolutely terrific, fascinating uh, discussion with you. Oh, wait, that book, you know, is not for sale. That I, will, I, I want everybody to get a copy, even <laughs> if he has to go out and uh, <laughs> buy them for you. Of, of American Journey. It is a wonderful book. I'm, I'm a part of it. It should be a more major part of it, but, but it's a real story of how Patriots, his family, and, yeah. and what it's like to come to America and make That's it true. in America. It's a hard, hard task at times, but the, the, but, but the Zachos, but Tom, the, the, the Patriots family. They'll uh, think I had the another family, the Zachos family, who did it too. But thank you for having me as a part, a part, a part of today. I have been honored.